Today's language models typically process and generate text in a fixed sequential ordering, from earlier tokens to later tokens, from earlier sentences to later sentences. So for a language like English, this would be the standard left to right direction. This obviously fits the common use cases. For example, in a chatbot scenario, we'd like the bot to respond to a user prompt provided beforehand, conditioned on a growing history of context built up during the course of the conversation. But the actual informational content in a sequence of text is the same, whether we produce it forwards or backwards, or in some other arbitrary order. And so we might assume it's just as easy for a model to learn to generate the same text in a different order. In this video, we're going to look at a paper that suggests this is actually not the case. Arrows of time for large language models. The basic idea is pretty simple. The authors take standard language models that produce text sequentially, and reverse the ordering of the tokens in the training sequences. The distribution over the sequences in the data hasn't changed at all, and the meaning of each sequence or each sentence hasn't either, only the order in which the model will produce the tokens. Again, intuitively, when first hearing this, you might think it should be just as easy to learn in this reverse time ordering, but we'll see empirically that there is a difference. The authors show that the reverse time ordering leads to a model that performs worse. And this effect isn't limited to models trained on English. It extends across multiple languages and even generalizes across different model architectures. So both modern transformers as well as earlier types of sequence models will be subject to this. As a quick review, when we have a standard language model that generates text sequentially, the overall probability that the model places on a given sequence is factorized as a product of conditional distributions, generating tokens in the order of their positions, so let's say we have a sequence of n tokens. We start by sampling x1 from some marginal distribution, that is, with no prior context to condition on. Then we'll sample an x2 conditioned on the value of x1, sample an x3 conditioned on the tuple x1, x2, and so on. This is known as autoregressive prediction, where each newly generated token gets fed back in as input to the model during the next step. The last token, xn, will be conditioned on the previous n-1 tokens already generated. If we flip the order of the tokens, we'll be factorizing the same distribution in a time-reversed manner. So the first token predicted would be xn, followed by xn-1, and so on until we finally reach x1. Now, the loss we'll try to minimize, in either case, is known as the cross-entropy or negative log likelihood loss. For a given sequence at a given time step, we'd like to minimize the negative of the log probability the model places on the true token, given the previously observed tokens. If we get rid of the negative, it's equivalent to maximizing the log probability of the true token. We want the model to place as much probability as possible on the real data we observe. The key fact is that if the forwards and backwards models have learned the same distribution over the data, that is, for any given sequence, they place the same amount of probability mass on that sequence, they will achieve identical losses. And if one model has not learned as well as the other, that is, on average, it places lower probability on some set of held-out test sequences, then its loss on that set will likewise be greater. Okay, so let's take a look at the first experiment here. The authors take a GPT-2 architecture and train it on English and French individually. Then, taking the exact same architecture and same optimization hyperparameters, they train the models again from scratch, but going backwards on each of the two languages. So everything is kept constant except the prediction ordering. Here we see the validation losses for the four models during training. French is green, English is magenta, and the solid lines show the forward model's performance while the dashed is the backwards models. After an initial period of similar loss in the very beginning of training, the backwards models get consistently greater loss than their forwards counterparts. Interestingly for French, the magnitude of the difference seems to be greater, but it's there for both. In fact, this effect is present for all natural languages the authors test. The left side numbers here are the absolute losses for the forward models on various languages, while the right side numbers show the relative percent change for the backwards model's losses. English, for some reason, out of all the tested languages, seems to have the smallest relative change in loss between the two directions. 
Now, one ablation the authors perform is on the context window size. For different window sizes, the y-axis here shows the relative difference between the backward and forward model losses. That is, again, what percent greater the backwards model loss is compared to the forwards. We see as context length grows, apparently the greater the effect of the arrow of time. For very small window sizes, it makes sense that the effect should disappear. In the extreme case, if we think of single token sequences, the forwards and backwards models are both just predicting sequences of length 1, and flipping the time axis doesn't do anything. Only once long-range sequential dependencies emerge is the forward model apparently able to take advantage of these to a greater extent than the backwards model. And similarly, we can look at different model sizes. As with context size, larger models exhibit a stronger arrow of time effect than smaller ones. A higher capacity forward model can evidently fit the data better than a backwards one of identical capacity. And the same effect is seen for other sequence model architectures, like GRUs and LSTMs. So the obvious question is why? Why do backwards models get greater loss? Well, the authors categorize hypotheses under two possibilities. The backwards probability distributions are either more challenging to be one represented by the model or two learned by the model, where case one automatically implies case two. If a model can't represent certain conditional distributions, then it obviously can't learn them. Here's a simple toy setting the authors give as an example domain where a backwards model is subject to these difficulties. They take primes, P and Q, and generate sequences with the string P times Q on the left and the resulting product on the right. So here, going forwards involves a multiplication step, but going backwards involves prime factorization, which of course is believed to be more computationally challenging in general. And we'll see that the backwards model, likewise, has a harder time. This table shows what's called the perplexity achieved by the model for each part of the sequence. As a reminder, this is basically e raised to the power of whatever total loss the model achieved for a given token or a string of tokens. The larger the perplexity, the more uncertain the model is about a given choice. In the forwards direction, after choosing P and Q, if the model was optimal, it would get zero perplexity for the product, since multiplication is completely deterministic. It doesn't quite get there, achieving 4.55 perplexity instead. However, the backwards direction is also supposed to be completely deterministic once you condition on a given product. There's only one pair of factors that forms the prime factorization, and only one way to write out that pair if we require that the smaller one comes first, which is how the data in this case is set up. But the model gets a perplexity of over 8 for the first factor, which means it's about as uncertain as if it was selecting over 8 equally good options. Not only does the backwards model not learn as well as the forward model here, but prime factorization itself is likely not even representable in models of reasonable size due to the complexity class it's believed to be in. This is all well and good, but it feels like a bit of an edge case to specifically consider a problem as difficult as prime factorization. So another synthetic setup the authors explore is what they call linear languages. They take sequences of bits, zeros and ones, where we'll have an invertible linear mapping from some string of bits on the left side of the sequence to a new string of bits on the right. This is still not quite the same thing as natural language, but it's intended to give a bit more general example that kind of approximates the interactions that initial words may have with each other to then influence later ones. Now what they specifically consider here is how sparse the linear transformation is. That is, what proportion of the matrix that represents the linear mapping consists of zeros, and how learnable this transformation is by the model. One thing to note here is that the inverse of a sparse mapping is usually much less sparse. That is, it has significantly fewer zeros in its corresponding matrix. What the authors empirically demonstrate is that the less sparse a transformation involved in a particular linear language, the harder it is to learn. It takes more training examples to reach a given loss, the less sparse the underlying transformation in the data distribution. Here along the x-axis, we see the number of non-zero coefficients for linear languages of a constant total sequence length. The average final loss seems to always increase as more non-zero coefficients are added. So the inverses of the originally sparse transformations, which are identical to simply flipping the order of the tokens, are therefore harder to learn. 
Now again, these linear languages are not equivalent to natural language, but the authors give a thought experiment to try to strengthen the connection. It basically illustrates how updates to languages during their development are likely to be sparse modifications of the forward transformations that underlie the language at any given time, and therefore easier to learn. If the opposite were true, and language updates were actually easier to learn from the reverse direction, it would mean there's some inefficiency in the current language structure, and it would be beneficial to rearrange it. This kind of makes sense, and I encourage you to read this section to see the full argument, but this is one area where I wish the authors had gone a bit further in making a concrete connection to real natural language. Of course, this probably represents a largely open question, with much remaining unknown about the rich, nonlinear interactions between words and natural languages, and just how sparse these interactions are in one direction versus the other. The paper concludes with a nice list of other open questions raised by these findings. Why does the strength of the arrow of time vary by language? Are there similar arrows of time in DNA sequences? What about video frame prediction? Is it strictly easier to predict frames going forward in time rather than backward? It's also interesting to wonder if the arrow of time seen here has any connection with the existing concept of the arrow of time from physics and thermodynamics. In this paper, they give mostly a computational complexity explanation, but maybe there are other factors playing a role. I'd love to hear your take on these results or any of these open questions. Drop your thoughts in the comments below. See you next time.